Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue reading You Don't Know Everything, Jilly P by Alex Gino. We're gonna pick up where we left off with chapter six when uh, um, Jilly has just found out that Emma, her baby sister, has um, is, is maybe deaf and has told her friend from the Delacorte chat, profound in Oaktown, that um, that this that's the case and was surprised when he didn't react exactly the way that she thought that he would. Chapter six. The next week, Emma has an appointment with an audiologist who specials in deaf and hard of hearing infants. Dad takes the afternoon off work so that he can be there. I wanna to go too, but mom says that it's more important for me to be at school. My claims that this would be in an invaluable life experience are ignored. I get home before them, so I make myself a JP, PB, and J. Making a proper JP, PB, and J is relaxing. Plus, then I get to eat a JP, PB, and J. I'm sitting down to enjoy the two halves of my sandwich when mom's car pulls into the driveway with dad's right behind it. It's a long time before they come inside. Or at least it feels like it is. It's long enough for me to finish eating and dump my dish in the sink anyway. When they do walk in, mom's eyes are red and dad's head hangs low. Dad puts Emma's car seat down, sits on the couch, and pats to the spot on his left for me to join him. I do, and mom takes a seat on the other side of me. She rubs her eyebrows with her thumb and forefinger. Dad runs his hand through his hair. Neither one of them says a word until I ask. So how did it go? No change, mom says. There are still a few other possibilities to rule out, dad says, but everything seems perfectly within healthy range for her age so far. Your sister may have diminished hearing, Jilly. What does that mean? Is she gonna stay deaf? Mom flinches at the word deaf. Quite possibly, Dad says. Mom nods. Well, what do we do now, I ask. We take it one day at a time. We have a few doctor's appointments to schedule to rule out some other possibilities, and then an appointment with the audiologist in two weeks. Can I come? We'll see how it goes. He puts on a crooked smile, pushes himself to standing and heads to the kitchen where he pulls out pots and lays out knives. Mom places a pillow in her lap and leans over with a grunt to pick up a squirming Emma. Emma settles in quickly for her afternoon snack and soon mom is staring off into space. Nobody talks very much during dinner and the things we do say are pretty boring. Dad asked me about my day, but he looks so tired that I could probably tell him that a pterodactyl flew through the window in math class and he would keep nodding. At one point, mom holds her fork in front of her face for over a minute. I time it on the kitchen clock. Her eyes are open, but I'm pretty sure she's asleep. She jerks back into action when I drop my glass onto the table. When we're done, mom and dad give each other a look that says, are you ready to talk? The one where one eyebrow goes up, pulling the corner of the mouth with it while the other side of the face acts like it doesn't know anything is happening. I don't know why they think I don't notice things or why they don't want to talk to me too. It isn't a respectful way to treat your daughter, if you ask me, which no one does anyway. Mom and dad excuse themselves to their room while I bring the dishes from the table to the kitchen. I load the dishwasher, pack the leftover chili in a plastic container, and fill the big pot with hot water to soak. I know how to help around the house. I know a lot more than my parents think I do. I also know that if I sit quietly on my closet floor and lean my ear against the wall, I can hear my parents in their bedroom. I head to my room, pull Leon the lion out into my closet, and lay him over a seat of shoes. Leon is a huge stuffed lion that Aunt Joanne g gave me when I was a baby. There are pictures of me as a toddler riding on it like it's a horse. Leon is named after Aunt Joanne's favorite city in France. She's never been there, but she's sure it's like no other city in the world. It's pronounced Leon, like you're eating the letter N instead of saying it. I rest on Leon and press my ear to the cold wall. The folds of the silky blue dress from my cousin Isabella's wedding last year brush against my other cheek. Like Dr. Clay said, it must just be that her ears are a bit underdeveloped and as she gets older, it all smooth out. That's mom. Petty, he said there was a slim chance of that. Dad's deep voice comes clearly through the wall. It's not clearing up. What went wrong? I was so careful, way more than I was with Jilly and she turned out just fine. My stomach f uh, jumps when I hear my name and enter the conversation. Maybe it's genetic, Dad says. 
but there's no one like that on either side of our family. It's because of the time I got sick. I just know it. You said it was a cold, but I'm sure it was a flu. I know I got a flu shot, but sometimes they don't work. And now, Patty, the doctor said it wasn't that. What does he know? Is his kid never going to hear? Let's make the appointments that Dr. Clay recommended and take it one step at a time. Mom pauses before responding. You're right, Nikki. I always am. I imagine dad giving his cheesy grin. Don't push it. I picture mom glaring back at him. I don't hear anything after that and I wonder if they've fallen asleep. Mom is probably curled up in bed with dad curled around her. I slip into bed with my laptop. Profound still isn't on Delacourt. There's no one else there that I really want to chat with at that moment. So I log back off. I click on the web search box and type in online American Sign Language Dictionary. The page fills with links. I click and a page with bright yellow border fills the screen. There are hands in four rows making different shapes. Behind each is the letter of the alphabet. I know just where to start. I click on a copper brown hand with her curled fingers resting along the length of her thumb. The screen fills with words beginning with the letter E. I click on the word eat. A woman with curly blonde hair and a black turtleneck, black turtleneck touches her hand to her mouth. Eat, my first sign, eat eat. When I go back to the alphabet, then I go back to the alphabet page and I click on S, which looks like a fist, not that different from E. There's a lot to learn about American Sign Language. I'm glad I'm starting early. My plan is to learn a word a day. If I keep it up, I'll know 365 words by the time Emma turns one and over 1,000 by the time that she's three. Since she's almost two weeks old, I have some catching up to do. I learn the word sleep and then diaper. Now, there, now I can sign Emma's three favorite activities, but I'm not done. I learned baby, I learned sister, and mother, and father. I learned purple, and blue, and green for Macy. I could find a sign for tur turquoise. Macy's not going to like that. Of all the signs I learned, sister is definitely the hardest. You're supposed to bring one hand from your cheek and have it smoothly meet your other hand. I keep hitting the tip of my finger, other finger, or worse, missing completely. Sister. I type a list of the words on my phone so that I can quiz myself. Mom and Dad might not be ready for Emma to be deaf yet, but there's no way I'm waiting another day to start learning how to sign. Chapter 7. Can you guess what this one is? I show Macy the sign I learned yesterday as we trudge uphill from the school. Um, your eyes itch? Close. It's cry. Yeah, I could see that. Where'd you learn that? From that deaf boy you have a crush on? No. I turn and look her in the face and almost trip over a crack in the pavement. I learned it from the internet. And besides, I do not have a crush on him. Oh my God, Jilly, you totally have a crush on him. Like the moment someone insists it's not a crush like that, it's always a crush. Says who? Says every episode of every show on the Disney Channel. Those shows are fake. Your crush isn't. My cheeks heat up a little more every time she says that word. Not a crush, I say, I'm trying to believe myself. Right, not a crush, not at all, and the earth is flat. Shut up. Luckily, we're nearing Macy's house, so the conversation has to end. See you tomorrow, Macy says, and tell your dad, I-T-Y-R-G. What? He'll know, say it back, I-T-Y-R-G. I-T-Y-R-G, got it. We do a quick baby sister slide, left hand two three, right hand two three, hips, 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 foot swoop clap, before Macy walks up the steps to her front door and disappears inside, leaving me alone to think of anything besides profound and failing. I spot Aunt Alicia's blue Volvo parked by the house. Volvos are pretty common in Piedmont, but I know it's hers right away because there's a fake canary in a cage that hangs from the rear view mirror. Aunt Alicia calls the bird Maya and says that she's there to remind her that we all have a song to sing. Sure enough, Aunt Alicia is in the kitchen when I walk in. The air smells like garlic and three pots bubble on the stove. In the living room, Jamila and Justin are chomping on popcorn and watching a video of talking clouds. Emma is fussing in her bouncer seat, like she's either trying to fall asleep or wake up. Mom is nowhere to be seen, but Jamila puts her finger to her lips and points to the closed bedroom door. Hey, Jamila, I whisper back. Hi, Justin. I put my hand up for a high five. 
he connects with two of his fingers on the first try and three on the second, but the third is palm on palm success. Then I swoop down and grab a fistful of popcorn out of his bowl. Hey, he yells. So I grab a handful of popcorn from Jamila's bowl as well, just to be fair. At the kitchen table, Aunt Alicia pours me a glass of orange juice and puts down a bowl to dump my popcorn hands into. Could have made a batch for you, you know. Less fun, I say, tossing a kernel into my mouth. You're gonna make some big sister. Planning on it. I down half my glass of orange juice in one go. So your so mom's asleep? I told your mother I would come over to take care of Emma and that she was more than welcome to go anywhere she wanted. She only she said the only where she wanted to go was out like a light. At least mom's getting her sense of humor back. I can't say I blame her though. After I had Justin, I didn't want to do anything but sleep for about a month. It was way worse the second time around. Thank goodness Aunt Joanne isn't pressuring me for a third. Couldn't Aunt Joanne have a baby, I ask? Could you imagine Joanne pregnant? No, I laugh. It would get in the way of her running schedule. You're right. That probably would be the part that would bother her the most, said Aunt Alicia. So how was school? You know, the usual teachers, tests, and tests, tests and textbooks. The three R's have become the three T's, huh? What? You know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Only one of those starts with an R. It's supposed to be clever. Oh. <laughs> I fake laugh so hard, and Aunt Alicia makes such a face that I start to real laugh. And so does she. She pulls out her phone from her bag to take a selfie of the two of us, and then stops. Seven messages? Let me check these, Jelly Bean. Aunt Alicia scrolls with her thumb. She clicks on her link. Her eyes flare up, and her mouth opens, and her hand comes up to cover her, her mouth. What is it? Nothing. Aunt Alicia stops. She blinks, bites her lip, and a tear drops out of her shining wet eye. No, wait, it's not nothing. She shakes her head a few times before switching to a nod. She takes a deep, heavy breath. It is something. A great, big something. A black boy was just shot, this time in Philly. He's in the hospital now. His name is James Dupree. They haven't found the guy who did it, but a witness said that James was pulling out his wallet to lend her a dollar, and then someone from across the street shot him. He's 13. She swallows. Oh, profound is 13. Aunt Alicia wipes her hands with her knuckles. And I just, I look at Justin over there and Jamila and I, she squeezes her eyes shut and shakes her head slowly. I feel guilty for thinking of profound before my own cousins. Maybe things will be different by the time they're older. I say as much to comfort myself as Aunt Alicia. Aunt Alicia takes a deep breath and then lets it out with a whoosh. That's a really sweet thought, Jelly Bean, but we've got a long way to go between here and there. What do you mean? Ask your mom and dad about James Dupree at dinner tonight. See what they say. She gives an unhappy smile like she knows what will happen and that it won't be good. I will. I wonder what they'll say. I wonder what Alicia thinks they'll say. You need any help with dinner? Aunt Alicia shakes her head. Thanks, Jelly Bean, but I think I'm going to mash the potatoes myself. Get a little frustration out. Why don't you go get your homework done? Then Aunt Alicia is quiet and focusing on her cooking. I join Jamila and Justin in the living room, where the talking cloud has become a singing sun. I pull out my Spanish textbook and start answering questions about what sports people in a picture like to play. I've moved on to math by the time the bedroom door opens and Mom steps out with a weak smile on her face. Hi, Jilly. Oh my goodness, Alicia, it smells amazing in here. I don't even know how to thank you. What are sister-in-law for? Aunt Alicia says. I didn't wake you up with all my banging, did I? Oh no, I was already awake. It just took me a little while to get out of bed. But then I started to ache, if you know what I mean. She gets herself a can of lemon soda from the fridge and sits on the table by the couch. I was just about ready to burst. Oh, don't I know it. I was so sore with both of them. I don't know what either of them is talking about until mom picks up Emma and settles into nurse. Oh, that. Well, I'll leave you to your children in your evening, says Aunt Alicia. I need to get these two home for dinner anyway. Be sure to take the chicken out in 15 minutes and then you're all set. Are you seriously going to go home and make another meal? Heck no, it's Joanne's night. So Shandong, I ask her, here's hoping. Thank you again, Alicia. You're a saint, says mom. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Of course, it would be rude to disagree. She makes a halo out of her hands and places it above her head with a laugh. If you ever need me to kick Joanne's butt for you, you let me know, says mom. 
I don't even know, need to know the reason. I hug Jamila and Justin super tight until they wriggle and yell. Then all three of them are gone. Dad gets home before Emma is done with dinner. He takes the chicken out of the oven and sets it on the table while Mom finishes feeding Emma. Then we dig into the meal Aunt Alicia made for us. This is pa practically a banquet. Dad said, Alicia just whipped this up on a Tuesday? That woman is a culinary genius. She sure is. Mom agrees. We are lucky people. So is Joanne. Once we've loaded up our plates with chicken, garlic mashed potatoes, and carrot, greens and carrots, Dad asked me about my day. Oh, you know, the three T's, testing, teachers, and textbooks. Aunt Alicia's line goes over pretty well, and I feel proud of myself. Then I remember what else she said. Did you hear about James Dupree? Is he a kid in your class? Dad asks. No, he's in Philadelphia. Oh, says Mom. Her eyes go wide, and then her face falls. That poor boy who got shot. Again, Dad asks. What was happening this time? He was pulling his wallet out of his pocket, and I say, and he's black. Mom and Dad both pause as if I've stopped time by mentioning James Dupree's race. They restart with a jolt like when a video gets stuck on the internet and has to catch up to itself. That's what I heard too, Mom says, nodding, and that he's in the hospital now. Dad doesn't say anything, so I keep going. Aunt Alicia and I were talking about whether Justin and Jamila are going to be safe. Oh, Mom says, putting down her glass. That's intense. That it is, said Dad. I can't even imagine being a mom to kids like Justin and Jamila. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Dad says, it's a lot for someone your age to take on. Justin and Jamila are younger than me, I remind him. Dad goes quiet again and takes a bite of chicken. And when I said that I hoped it would be different by the time they got older, Aunt Alicia says, we've got a long way to go between here and there. Oh, said Dad, putting down his fork and taking a deep breath. Oh, Mom echoes. She has a point there. We've made a lot of progress, Dad said. We'll make more. He puts a bite of mashed potatoes in his mouth. That seems to be the entirety of his thoughts on the subject. Because after he swallows, all he says is, Mmm, this is delicious. Mom stares at her plate and doesn't say anything. I want to say something, but I don't know what. Maybe that's how Mom and Dad feel, too. So how's Macy? Dad asks a few bites later. She's okay. Oh, and she sends you one of her Morse code messages. It's I-T-R-Y-G or something. They're not Morse code, they're initialisms. And I-T-R-Y-G, huh? Dad's face wrinkles. Then he asks, are you sure it was an I-T-Y-R-G? Could have been. How am I supposed to worry about a couple of letters when Aunt Alicia doesn't know if my cousins are going to be safe? Are they even safe now? And if Justin and Jamila aren't safe because they're black, does that mean that Emma and I are safe because we're white? Feel weird even thinking about that. Well, tomorrow at school, tell her that I think she's really great too. I T Y R G T. Dad doesn't say anything about James Dupree from Philadelphia. Neither does mom. And so they talk about their days and who's taking Emma to her next three doctor's appointment. So I finish dinner quickly so I can go to my room and text Aunt Alicia. Me. I tried to talk with mom and dad about the boy in Philly. Aunt Alicia. James Dupree? How did that go? Me. Dad changed the subject. Aunt Alicia. I'm not surprised. Me. I wanted to bring it up again, but I didn't know what to say. Me. But it was big in my head. Aunt Alicia. See what I mean now? Me. Not really. Aunt Alicia. Black parents in this country have to talk with their kids about being careful around police. But until white parents can talk about what's happening to black kids too, nothing's going to change. Me. Oh. Aunt Alicia, so keep talking and keep asking questions. Me, I love you, Aunt Alicia. Aunt Alicia, I love you too, Jelly Bean. Chapter eight. I'm in the living room. Uh, I'm in the living room window looking for Macy. We're getting together to watch One Last Summer. I don't really get what's great about it, but it's Macy's favorite movie and she's begging to watch it. We're gonna make a whole movie night of it at her house, so it's going to be really fun, even if the movie is only okay. Macy's mom has a huge flat screen TV in her bedroom, and since she's going to be out on a date, she said that we could use it. We're going to turn off all the lights in the house like we're in our own personal theater. We're going to make popcorns, and we have red vines and orange soda ready. Usually I would just walk down to Macy's house, but she's coming here first to say hi to Emma. Emma can't say hi back or even smile yet, but she's pretty cute to look at when she's not screaming. 
I see Macy walking down the block and I get to the door in time to pull it open just as she presses the doorbell. Make her jump, but she recovers quickly and gives me a hug that knocks me back into the house. Hey G JD, Macy says when she notices that on the couch. And hey JBSE. JBSE, I ask. Jillian's baby sister, Emma, dad says like it's obvious. And maybe to him and Macy it is, but I don't think that way. YG, JD. YVG. Macy gives dad a high five. HT, dad asks. How's things? The only reason I know that one is because I've asked before. NB, AY, CC, dad says. Dad whispers con to confirm. Can't complain? YGI. Who under the age of 40 says can't complain, I ask. Why? JBFF does. Dad says, you two are weird, I say. J, uh, y, YWA says Macy. Yes, we are. Dad laughs. Macy washes her hands in the kitchen before kneeling down to say hi to Emma. Emma is looking as innocent as can be, wide-eyed with awe at a new face to stare at, as if she hadn't been hollering her head off three minutes ago because, well, who knows why she was crying that time. She just stopped on her own. Macy is holding out her index finger, brushing the sides of it along Emma's tiny fingertips until Emma's hand wraps around Macy's finger and hangs on tightly. To be honest, I love doing that, too. It falls in the 10% of cute things she does. Sometimes I get her to hold one of my fingers in each of her hands and I pretend that we're dancing. But if I tell Macy that, she's gonna wanna do that too. And I wanna go, so instead I say, Macy, movie night? Oh yeah, right. See ya, JD. H-A-G-N. Y-T. Have a good night, you too. Even though it's warm out, the November sun doesn't last the way a summer afternoon does. There's already a little orange in the sky. I see what you mean about the Mount Coffee Table barometer being off the charts, Macy says. We learned about barometers in school last year. They're kind of like thermometers for air pressures. The Mount Coffee Table barometer is an indication of how stressed mom and dad are. There's always a mess on Mount Coffee Table, kind of like there's always snow on Mount Everest, but the size of it changes. Once or twice a year, they manage to clean it right down to the art books and unopened mail. Right now, the pile has got to be two feet high in the middle and half of it is pamphlets and articles and magazines about babies with hearing loss, which is totally weird. Why is it weird? Wouldn't your parents be looking to read everything that they can get their hands on? No, I mean the words hearing lost. Emma hasn't lost her hearing. She just never had any in the first place. True. It's more like your parents are the ones at the loss. They can hear fine. No, I mean they were expecting to have another kid who can hear and everything, and now they have to get used to the idea that they don't. You know, you're so annoying when you're smart, right? Macy just grins and shrugs. Back at her place, Macy starts the movie and gushes about how the on-screen romance between Franz and Kyla is one of the sweetest things she's ever witnessed. Have you ever seen a movie so good? A relationship so real? It's no Vassalvar or anything. A Vassalvar is a strong, romantic, and psychic connection in Vidalia. It's what keeps Gwinello from fighting for Maglin, the knife thrower from the north, even when all hope is lost. What? Never mind, I say, when I remember that Gwinella doesn't learn about Vassalvars until the beginning of Hearts and Arrows, so Macy's never read about them. She's only read Swords and Secrets, and that's because I begged her to. Is that a magically delicious Vidalia thing? Magically mysterious Vidalia? And you know, you know it. A Vassalvar is the deep emotional connection that Gwinella and Maglin have that I stop when I realize that Macy's eyes are back on the screen, mouthing Kyla and Franz' lines. She doesn't ask me to continue. Instead, I take a red vine, bite off the tip with my teeth, and stick it into my orange soda, sucking sugar named for a color out of a straw made of sugar named for another co color. There is a first class joke in there somewhere, but I can't find it. Normally I would ask dad for help, but nothing at home feels quite right anymore. Mom and dad drag through the day, like every smile is an act and every joke is a performance. And at night, Emma keeps us all up with her screams. Mom and Dad walk around like zombies who are half asleep instead of half dead in a tired dance of diapers, laundries, and pan flips about hearing loss. Dad is so sleepy in the morning that he tried to feed us granola with sour cream instead of yogurt. Twice. And he didn't even laugh the second time I told him, this is sour cream, but it is not our cream. Before Emma was born, that would have killed. And Vidalia, Moms and Dad's green hues would start to fade. 
and the other people that they passed on the journey at the market would notice and transfer a little en extra energy their way. And when they couldn't make it out of the house, the others would think of them and make sure they made it through the day. And so if we're in this world where no one has an aura, no one really knows what anyone thinks of anything. My best friend Macy is right here, and I think I know her pretty well, but imagine how much more I'd know her if her aura shifted to let me know how she's feeling. And that's my best friend. How much better would it be if we could see the auras of people we didn't know as well? People like Profound. A bubbly wave washes over me at the thought of him, coating everything in a tingly warmth and leaving behind it a film of self-consciousness. I wonder what Profound would think of one last summer. I don't think he'd like it, especially not the ending, where things just work out the way that you expected them to and everyone is happy. He likes things a little more complicated. And complicated is certainly how I feel about him. I'm so deep in my head I don't even notice that the movie is over and the credits have started until Macy starts pelting me with unpopped kernels of popcorn. There you are, she says when I finally turn my head that her way. Now you have to pick them up. What? You can't leave my mom's bed a mess. But you threw them. Yeah, but they're closer to you. That's ridiculous. I, I'm about to complain when Macy breaks into a grin and starts picking up the yellow kernels. Fine, fine, but don't say I never did anything for you. So are you dream daydreaming about your crush, boy? I do not have a crush on him. I don't know what I'm feeling yet, but it's definitely not a crush. Were you thinking about him? Among other things, yeah. You have a crush on him. I wish you would stop saying that. I wouldn't have to say it if you would just admit it yourself. Whatever. We switch to a cartoon about a talking pig and his pet goose and duck who also talk, but all I can think about is profound and how irritatingly right Macy thinks she is. That's the end of what we're going to uh, read to you today. We'll pick up tomorrow with chapter nine. We've been reading You Don't Know Everything, Jilly P by Alex Gino. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for listening. Bye.